Welcome everyone to TAM lab number 18. Uh, today we're going to be doing a Horizon Unified Access Gateway or UAG uh, deployment and config with a, an external RADIUS uh, server to simulate a multi-factor authentication process or MFA. Uh, so we're excited to have Brian Wuckner here presenting today. Uh, and with that, before I hand it over to him, I'm going to do a quick uh, intro here for TAM lab. So uh, if you want to get more involved with TAMLAB, we do have the four social channels set up here. SharePoint is our headquarters, and the link is in the bottom right there. And if you have an idea for an upcoming session or you're even interested in hosting, uh, we've added a new link on the left side of our SharePoint site to submit an idea for a, a session. So uh, go there and click that and fill out the form, and we'll get it on the schedule. And with that, I'm going to stop my PowerPoint and stop sharing and I'll hand it over to Brian and take it away. Cool. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate the intro. All right. So uh, hopefully here in the next hour, I plan to deploy uh, two U or one UAG two times. So the first pass will be through the UI so we can see what that looks like. Uh, and maybe uh, gain an appreciation for why we might want to automate that using the, the PowerShell deployment option. Then we'll walk through the PowerShell deployment option. Um, and you know, if there's any questions along the way, feel free to stop me. Um, so you know, as Steve mentioned, the unified access gateway uh, is part of the end user computing uh, stack of, of parts. Um, and it replaces like the security server, but it's used for things other than Horizon, um, like uh, uh, maybe Workspace ONE, Identity Manager, that sort of thing. So to get started, we'll go ahead and uh, start deploying the OVA. Um, and, and we'll do that and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the other configuration options once that gets going, because it does take a minute to get deployed. So I've already downloaded the UAG 3.5 OVA file. So we'll just select that. We'll pick a folder to place the VM in, and then we'll give it a name. I'm assuming we need to have uh, like DNS set up ahead of time for this. Yep. Um, uh, I've already created a, a TAMLAB UAG 11 uh, a record, uh, and I've already created an SSL certificate, and we'll talk about that in a second, too. Okay. Um, but the second uh, step after we pick a folder where we want the VM, we have to pick like a cluster or a host that we want to put it on. I'm going to pick a specific host because I've got one host offline in my cluster. All right, so it's gonna ask us for some details. We'll just say next to that. Here's where things get uh, somewhat interesting. Right? We have to get, pick what uh, configuration or deployment type we want. And so the, the UAG can be deployed with one, two or three NICs and then in just a regular size or a, a large for each of those three choices. These uh, large choices are new to 3.5. They have to do with like Workspace ONE for you know, 10,000 plus user environments. Uh, what we're deploying here is a lab, so we'll stick in the regular size category. Um, for this lab, we'll do single NIC. Two NIC is just a slightly more advanced configuration where the kind of the back end traffic and the management traffic are separated from the internet traffic. Um, and then in, in the three node internet, the back end and the management traffic are all separated into three distinct NICs. So you could put them in different networks or, you know, uh, arrange them between firewalls, that sort of thing. Uh, like I said, for, for what we're doing, we'll keep it simple and just do one network adapter. We'll thin provision, put it on some storage. Um, we said single NIC, but when we get to this stage, it actually asks us to pick 
uh, from you know, all three adapters, which one we want to assign to what. Uh, when we do one NIC, it's only really the internet adapter that gets deployed. So I'm gonna pick a network to put that on. And then we have to answer some questions, right? So uh, first one is how we want to assign an IP address. I'm gonna do a static IPv4 address. Um, I do not need to create any forward rules. I do have an IP that I want to assign. I don't need a custom route, no IPv6. DNS records, we'll type in our DNS server. It's a separated list. IPv4 net mask. IPv4 default gateway. name, and then whether or not we want to enjoin the customer experience improvement thing, we'll leave that checked. We'll type in our super secret VMware one bang password. We'll do that like four times. There's, uh, you can set different passwords for the root uh, account on the appliance versus the REST API. I'm just gonna keep them the same because I'm lazy. And then uh, we've got an option to enable SSH. I've never really had a need to SSH into a UAG. It's a, a pretty self-contained box. So I'm um, not sure why you'd want to turn that on, but I typically leave it off. And then we'll say finish. So that's kind of the, the you know, core questions that you get uh, asked inside of the OVA deploy. Uh, so when this gets done, we'll turn the appliance on. It goes through kind of a first boot process, takes a, a minute to do that as well. Uh, but then we will log in and configure a few other things like what we want to use for authentication um, and what we want to uh, actually have this appliance proxy for us. And, and what we'll do is just point it at a horizon environment that's already set up. So I won't talk through that a whole lot, uh, but did want to take a moment to talk about the authentication piece. So when I was uh, first going through this, um, I, I had, you know, two things in mind. One, I wanted to show a customer how to uh, do the, uh, the PowerShell deploy piece uh, because that seemed interesting. Uh, you know, if, if you end up deploying a handful of these, uh, there ends up being a lot of questions that you have to answer, you know, one appliance at a time. Uh, and then when you go to do an upgrade, there's no real direct upgrade path for a UAG. It's just deploy and configure a new one. Um, and, and so it becomes tedious and it would be easy to forget things so that there's a PowerShell option. Like when you go download UAG, there's a zip file that's got a script and some configuration file examples there that you can pick from. And I just wanted to mess with that. And then the second piece was um, I had built this horizon environment in a lab and I wanted to be able to connect to it um, when I you know, wasn't at my home office and uh, UAG seemed like a clever way of doing that. And then one of the other things that the UAG can do for us, we can uh, allow it to handle some of the external authentication. So like if, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on um, you know, pre-UAG customer using a security server, they would have to have like separate connection servers that were paired with their security server. And on those uh, connection servers, they would configure authentication differently. So if they wanted to use RSA or RADIUS for authentication, they would configure it on those dedicated connection servers. I didn't really have enough capacity to have, you know, one horizon environment, let alone a handful of connection servers. Um, so UAG kind of gives, you know, that flexibility of handling that authentication um, on the edge on, on, on this appliance. And when this comes up, we'll, we'll go through that. Um, but, you know, my problem also was that I didn't have any sort of two-factor authentication provider already in my lab. Um, and, you know, if, if you've ever looked through some of the RSA Secure ID documentation, that's kind of a, a heavy uh, deployment. There's lots of pieces to that. Um, and it's also something I, I didn't have licensing for. 
So I, I stumbled around online and I found a, um, a blog post that walked through creating a Linux box that was joined to Active Directory that used a Google Authenticator, uh, kind of a random number, like a one-time use password number generator. So the password changes based on time. And, and so you get like 60 seconds to enter the, the code that Google Authenticator shows. Um, and so this, this Linux box that you would build would expose um, the Google Authenticator number as a radius service. And, and radius was something that um, you know, Horizon would connect to and the UAG would connect to. I spent some time messing around with that. Um, wasn't really super complicated. Um, I, I ended up posting a blog post myself of that. Uh, probably could use some updates. I haven't went through that process in quite some time. Um, but I ended up with this radius box. And the way it works, and we'll do like a, a quick uh, little test here. Uh, I'll log into it. And then I'll copy and paste this command in. So this rad test is a radius test utility that's going to show up on Linux once you install all of the, the radius components. Um, VDI test is a username. VMware one exclamation mark is that user's password. And then this is the IP of a radius server and then just um, radius authentication port. And this is a shared secret that um, the radius service uses. So what I'm going to do is just run this command just like it is. And what should happen is I get an access reject, right? Because Radius is expecting not only the password, but also a, um, a, a number, a one-time use password that uh, changes every 60 seconds. So I'm going to go get that number real quick. Uh, but first, I'm going to turn this UAG on and let it start booting. Hey, Brian, can you share the link to that blog that you wrote? Will do. I, I've actually got some notes that I've started typing up with some links to like the UAG documentation. And the, when we get to the deployment part, there's an INI &I file we'll have to configure. So links to documentation on that. And I'll, I'll throw, I think it might be one or two blog posts, but I'll, I'll throw links in there as well. Okay, cool. All right. So I've got this uh, Google Authenticator plugin inside of Chrome. And so VDI test is the name of that user account. This is the password. Um, you can see we've got probably about 30 seconds left to type it in, but it just goes at the end of the actual password. So uh, AD password plus the you know, number that changes every 60 seconds. And I got that quick enough before it changed. It says access accept, which means that the radius accepted that token. Uh, the numbers change, so if I try that same uh, string again, it'll reject it, right? Because I my number changed and I didn't uh, didn't get the right number. This number is generated based on like a time sequence, so like NTP um, is super touchy. Like it, normally, you can get away with you know time sync between like Active Directory and components of like uh, member servers within like five minutes. So I think that's the Kerberos. If there's a if there's a, some difference in time between like this Linux box that's providing Radius uh, and like Active Directory or, or uh, the actual time where this number is being generated, authentication will fail. So it, time's super super picky, um, but yeah, you know, kind of makes sense why it would be that way. All right, so uh, that's, that's probably about as much radius as we'll want to cover. Our appliance has booted up here, so we'll uh, go try and access, let me move this uh, bar here on the other monitor. TPS colon AM lab, 
UAG 11, 9443, that's the admin port for the UAG. And it's still thinking about it. And so it does take a minute. Um, once we power this thing on, it, it goes through like a first boot process. I bet if I refresh this, memory still kind of high on the, the appliance. Once this drops down to, to green or about 20% where it normally idles at, that means everything's started and kind of ready to go. We'll just keep hitting. Uh, oh, there we go. All right, so once we get a, yeah, I was afraid of that. Um, so Chrome enforces HSTS, which is like a HTTP, uh, strict something or other that has to do with certificates. And I had, I'd already deployed this uh, appliance as a test. Um, and so it's, uh, it knows about the certificate that the appliance once had. So we'll just, um, try this again. Okay. Using a different browser, this works fine. So we'll type admin, we'll type in our super secret password, and we get to the appliance uh, UI. This is where we can change stuff. So we'll say that we want to configure things manually. All right. And I mentioned um, I had done this earlier and that's why I was getting that certificate issue. I had applied a actual CA signed cert to both the admin and internet interfaces that was in a PFX format. So we'll go um, pick that file out. And that has a password, it's just VMware. And we'll hit save. Hey Brian, I know uh, looking at the cert itself and how you generate it and all that is probably out of scope for this, but would love to see any kind of uh, blog posts or documentation you followed to do yeah. that because I uh, think that's let me make a new something pretty, that. Um, yeah, probably so pretty think, common. Yeah, organizations. Create. Not so much in my lab, but <laughs> yeah. So let, let's take a, a second look at that. I'm just making a note to add that to the doc here in a second. Okay. All cool. right. Um, so I'm going to close this tab, right? Because it, it says that it applied the new certificate. That means if we go back here to Chrome, I'm probably not going to get that HSTS error because it, it was, ex Chrome was expecting a certificate that wasn't there. So it thought somebody had uh, attacked and tried to do like a man in the middle thing and it was protecting me. Um, although I did not want their help with protecting there. Okay. So let's look at that certificate here real quick. So I, I found a, an easy way of doing this, and it was uh, just in some blog somewhere. Um, but I was able to just inside of like uh, Windows Certificate Manager on, on a PC, just you know, right click and say request new certificate inside that management console. And then say that I wanted uh, to create a domain issued cert. And, and so in my lab, I've got um, one of the domain controllers actually runs certificate services. Um, and it's, you know, ca.example.com. That's, that's the name that I gave the CA when I installed it. Um, and, and I guess maybe just a step back, just one more step. So like I have, uh, this enterprise admins.org is a domain that I own. And then my lab, like the domain controllers for the lab provide lab.enterpriseadmins.org. And so that's all internal. That doesn't, you know, exist outside of, of my lab. But then I also created a separate uh, DNS zone uh, on that domain controller for example.com. And so when I, uh, you know, create like um, uh, whatever I'm going to do, or if I want to take screenshots of something to show it to a customer, I'll typically create DNS records in this example.com zone. So the screenshots will show like, vcenter.example.com or you know, in this case ca.example.com um, and it kind of just makes everything you know look kind of like a legit example um, super simple to do um, and and that example.com is like a reserved top level or um, example.com.net and 
uh, I want to say .org are all like reserved domain names that like nobody can buy. There'll never be any content on those pages that you want. So, you know, you can easily just steal that domain name and use it for a lab if you want. But when I created the certificate, I did give it um, some different uh, subject alternative names. So I put the IP address of the cert, a friendly name, and then the actual server name that we deployed in here. Um, this is something you, you know, customers would likely do. Let's say they're going to load balance UAGs. They would probably want the, the friendly name of the, uh, uh, like the, uh, I won't call it a load balancer because I think there's a thing built into uh, UAG starting in 3.4 where you can actually create like an HA pair of them. I haven't messed with that, but from what I understand, if, if you go down that route, um, the shared name that all of the appliances has um, needs to exist as a, like a, an alternate name in the certificate on each appliance. Um, so, you know, it'd be common to see a SAN cert like this on a UAG. Um, so, is there a question? Yeah, so uh, it sounded like you haven't really gone down that HA pair path, but do you know, does that require like a third party load balancer, like an NSX or a FA? Um, so, I messed around with it and um, I just I didn't need HA. Um, we can, um, let's actually go look at that real quick. So it's actually super simple to set up. Uh, there's this HA settings area of the config that you just enable. You give it like a virtual IP address that needs to be in that same subnet as your, um, uh, both appliances would need to be in the same like layer two subnet. And then this IP would also need to be in that subnet. So we could give it like a 36.10 address. And then you create this group ID and everything that's in this like group of UAGs would have to have the same uh, group ID. And I think this is a number between one and like 255. Yeah. And then um, we'll hit save. And I think what happens is this thing will end up with two IP addresses. We could probably actually go back over here and see if that's what tools ends up reporting. Um, but I think it works kind of like, uh, I want to say log insight has a load balancer that's kind right. of similar to this where it's yeah. just like an IP that they all share. The integrated load balancer. It's super. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that, cool. that makes it easy. Um, I had a, a problem when I did this before where, um, I think I had like an ARP cache issue on, on a switch somewhere and it, it stopped working after I did that. So I've, I've kind of left it alone uh, and haven't really went back and revisited that. Um, but okay, so let's see what other things that we need to set in here. So uh, this UAG name was set through the, the OVA deploy tool. Password age is a thing that I like to change because I don't change passwords every three months. Um, you can set a syslog server. Um, you know, a handful of other changes. There's a session timeout I've seen uh, customers change. There's the CEIP setting that we can either set to yes or no. That, that happens through the uh, OVA deploy as well. But the, the fun pieces are really kind of these edge service settings and authentication settings. So the, the first thing we will go do is enable radius. Uh, and then we'll go in our, all of our radius info here. And some of this is the stuff that was, you know, on, on the command line when we did that putty session earlier. Um, that's the shared secret um, that the radius server is expecting. Uh, number of authentication attempts allowed. I think I did the three, three, say three. Yes, this one. 12 is the port. We can go in here and um, you know create a secondary, enable a secondary server. So if we have like a backup radius box, we could list that in here as well. Um, for the purpose of this first demo, we won't do that. We've got all that info typed in. Uh, we'll save that. We've already replaced our cert. 
So now we'll mess with some edge service settings. Uh, this is where we can tell it what things we want it to proxy for. And in this case, we want to do just Horizon stuff. <clears throat> so we'll enable that. My connection server is called vdi.example.com. Super creative. We'll connect IPv4. We'll enable Blast. Copy and paste this in. And we'll tell Blast to use the UHE so that it's you know going through this thing and actually using it. And I'm going to save these settings. Uh, proxy destination URL must begin with HTTP. Is it down below? Is there more? I think last time I did this, I only turned one of them on, but let's say tunnel as well. Mm, I really feel like it's just, just this one. I wonder if I need like a trailing slash. Let's say cancel, let's do it again. BDI.example.com. See if it lets me save that with nothing. Nope. Oh, do you need HTTPS in front of BDI.example.com? Mm. No. See, I had a weird thing when I set this up last time. Uh, I ran through this right before the call just to make sure I had it down. And it, it didn't work once, and then I just tried it again, and it worked the second time, so I thought maybe I had typed something wrong. But that's why I copied and pasted it from over here. What's it, See that little more button on the bottom? Is there anything more missing? Yeah, it gives you all sorts of extra things. Um, hmm. Let's do... I was able last time, I think, to – I think I had to put this in at one point, but I didn't think I had to do it right away. This thumbprint – let me copy that over to – Valid proxy destination scheme. Proxy destination. URL must begin with HTTP. <laughs> Looks like that box gateway location is highlighted red. If you go down. Oh, there you go. Huh. Let's pick external. Let's see what that does. Good call. All right. So let me save it. Let's try it one more time here. VDI.example.com. IPv4, blast, more, external. <laughs> all right, let's enter all the things. I've got a... Uh, If you hover over the, the little information button next to the very first text box up there, uh, the one below it, sorry. It does want uh, HTTPS. Oh, maybe you got to put colon 443 at the end.
Oh, there you go. Look at that. Hey. Figured it out. Little Google searching never hurts. <laughs> <laughs> What's weird is, let me look over here on my other one. Um, oh, yeah. Yep. Um, the one that works does have HTTPS in it. Good call. I, my documentation isn't great. Story of my life. Yeah, that's all good. Nobody's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we've got our uh, connection server listed. We've got our um, thumbprint listed. I think last time, right after I did that, yeah, these things all turned green, right? So destination server and blast are all listed green. And we haven't um, we haven't done anything with authentication yet because auth method is just set on select, right? So we we haven't told the UAG to do anything special with regard to authentication. So we will add a new server to our horizon thing. So we'll do like VDI test and then we'll just put in our regular password. And we haven't changed anything with regard to authentication. The UHG is just passing things straight through to the connection server. So this is just regular password, no radius or anything's been configured. Um, we hit enter and then we see the, the stuff that's been published to us. So I'm gonna disconnect, we'll go through this again uh, after configuring radius and we should see kind of some different authentication options. All right, so in here again, we'll say we wanna look at more stuff. Authentication methods is radius that we already configured. Plus we also want to do password authentication. So we could either do an and or an or. I'm gonna do and because I want both of them. And then there's a uh, checkbox a little bit lower down here that says match Windows username. I'm not going to check this um, right now. I'll hit save. And we'll hit this page or this login again. And you can see we now get something different that doesn't have my domain name in it. It just has the username and passcode. And what's our radius username and passcode? So we'll do VDI test, we type in the AD password, because that's what uh, the radio server is going to expect is that plus this number. So we'll get that number on screen, 808415. Cool. And so now it, you know, radius checked out, it was good. So it brought us to the second screen. And now we can type in our just AD password. One thing that we can do though, is we could actually change this username if we wanted to, which I, I think is kind of quirky. I've got a customer that actually does it this way because they use different usernames between their two-factor system and their like actual Active Directory accounts. So because of that, they need users to type in a new name here. The problem with that is that any, uh, any two-factor credentials will get them past that first authentication. And then once you're past that first you know, two-factor authentication, you can use any other username to actually authenticate here, um, which is, I don't think, great. In my case, they're both actually the same. So I'm gonna go back in here and I'm gonna check that box that says match Windows username. Um, one other thing we can do while we're at it is here under our authentication settings for radius under more options there's a place where we can give our login page passphrase a, a hint so this is where you know it says you know please enter radius username and, and passcode we can say like uh, tam lab mfa for multi-factor authentication so we did both of those things we'll go try and get this on screen here and then we'll try and connect again so it wants my VDI test password, 190438. And so now we can see, oh, I forgot to point out on that last screen that the uh, login banner was different, but this time VDI test, you know, we can't, um, we can't click in there, we can't type it. So once we 
used um, Radius for the one-time password. That's the only user that's able to log into Windows. I'm going to say cancel and do this one more time. So here's where TamLab MFA shows up, right? So this is the hint part of the login banner. And so we just changed it um, uh, without too much effort. And I'll, uh, I'll log in one more time here just so we can see that all of our apps work. And we'll launch something super taxing like command prompt. And so this is a command prompt that's running on a terminal server. You can see we're logged in as VDI test and it's um, something called RDSH01, which isn't the name of my, my desktop here. Uh, this, this is magic here. Um, all right, so we'll say exit. Now we'll jump into um, the fun part. So this was, you know, uh, this was a lot of config. I obviously got stuff wrong in here a couple of times when we were going through this the, the first time. That wasn't intentional. Um, that, that was just me not, not knowing what's going on. But once we get into um, the scripted way, you can see why, um, why I would like that a little bit better. So appliance is still here and running and you know, powered on. We're going to use the script to deploy a new appliance with the same name. So in theory, it could be, um, you know, we're going to do an upgrade, right? This could be UAG 3.4 and we're going to go to 3.5 or, or something like that. So the way it works, uh, when you go download the UAG OVA, there's this zip file. Um, the zip file has a bunch of things in it. There's a PowerShell module a PowerShell script, um, some other PowerShell scripts, like if you're going to use Hyper-V or EC2 or Azure for deployment, I I'm just going to use this UAG deploy because we're deploying to vSphere. And then they have, what is this, ends up being like 12 example scripts or uh, example configurations. So you know, if you want to use Secure ID, Radius, Smart Card, um, I'm thinking this might be AirWatch or something. Um, Yeah, so AirWatch and it's got all the API server stuff. So this must be some of that uh, like content thing we were looking at that we didn't, uh, or at least I didn't understand. Um, so some of those other pieces can be configured this way as well. So handful of examples here inside of the, the script bundle. There's also a, a link that I'll put in this doc that I'll send over to Steve. Um, there's a couple of them, there's the actual See if this opens here. Uh, the actual documentation from you know, docs.vmware.com that goes through a bunch of the example things that you can put into a config. Um, talks about how to run the script, requirements, that sort of thing. And then we also have, uh, there's a communities page uh, that stays fairly current as well. You can see it was just updated this month uh, right after the uh, 3.5 release of UAG talks a little bit about, you know, why you'd want to use the script and whatnot, how to use it, and then all of the configuration properties that we would need that are in kind of those example scripts are not only called out here, they're described so that you know, you know, what goes in there and why you would use them. Um, for our purposes, I've already got a config mostly done. Um, so, you know, once the path to our OVA, uh, it wants to know where to, to put stuff. This is kind of a quirky uh, format. Um, it's described pretty well in uh, this thing. Um, so it gives you examples of what you want. This is how the OVF tool, which is really what's, what's going to run once we kick off this script. OVF tool uh, expects this kind of format. If you have password listed in all uppercase, it prompts you for the password. My password isn't actually password. This just says, you know, uh, stop and, and ask for my password. Um, one thing that uh, a customer of mine found out, all of these paths in here are case sensitive. Um, so you got to be kind of slightly careful when you're doing this stuff. Again, once you have this file ready, if you just save it, 
there's really not a lot of um, stuff that you might go back and add. It's, it's more of just kind of a, a one-time thing. Uh, but we'll go back over here. Um, we can see, you know, we've got a data store called out that we wanted thin provision. We've only got one network adapter, uh, that internet facing NIC, since we're gonna do a, a one NIC deployment type. These are commented out, so these don't do anything. Uh, we've got the same IP, uh, default gateway, and all that stuff in here. We've defined DNS and syslog. Uh, we set that one password expiration to zero. Uh, we told it that we wanted to go into the TAM lab folder. There's one thing that um, I do want to add that wasn't in here. So when you uh, assign an SSL certificate, there's the one for the internet facing traffic, but then there's also one that you can use for the admin traffic. Let me look at my notes here. It's just called SSL cert admin. And I'm gonna use the same cert for both of them since it's a one NIC deployment and they you know, are the exact same thing. There's no real reason to have two different certificates for me. Um, here's where I could have told that we did need HTTPS on that uh, connection server name, right? Because it's clearly listed in this file. I, I should have just looked here. Um, we got our thumbprint listed. We've got our, you know, tunnel blast external URL, all that stuff listed. Uh, we've got our authentication method. Um, this is that display hint that we get. Um, we'll call it TAM lab number two, since we're deploying this again. That way when we log in, we'll know that uh, this actually got updated. I do actually have two radius servers in the lab. I only configured one because it was kind of tedious to enter all that stuff manually, but um, let's go ahead and save this. Hey Brian, real quick. I'm curious if, remember when we were having problems saving the uh the settings when we did it manually. Yeah. And we had to have HTTPS, but we also added the port at the end. Yeah. I don't Can think we... the port was required. Do you want to put it in here just to be? Well, I want to go back to the to the one you deployed manually and just change okay. it and see if it breaks. All right, good idea. That way we know. Because it's a lab, right? Let's break it. Uh, whoop. Do, 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 do. Yep, that must not have been needed. Cool. Well, now we know. Yep, good, good call. All right, so we got this changed. We added our one section in here about uh, cert admin. We changed our, uh, our hint on our two-factor thing. We save the file. Open PowerShell. We'll go to the directory that's got our stuff in it. It's called TAM Lab. So we've got our PowerShell module, our PowerShell script. The, uh, we don't really need this zip file in here, it's just there for reference, but our INI file's in the same directory and so is our uh, certificate. So we'll just start by saying UAG deploy uh, and hit tab, that's the PS1, it's the PowerShell script. So we'll hit space and then hyphen, we'll just use tab to kind of auto-complete stuff. So the first thing it wants is the INI file. That happens to be called TAM lab UAG11.ini, so tab completion for the win. Uh, hyphen again, root password. Uh, um, I'll do it without these parameters. Uh, so, so you can specify parameter. It'll say, you know, uh, root password equals VMware one bang. If I don't specify that, when the script runs, it'll pop up and say, hey, you need a root password, and you can type it uh, twice, once, you know, uh, to enter it, and then again to confirm it. And it, it, there's some checks in there to make sure you enter the same thing twice. Um, to keep it kind of quick, we'll just type it in here because everybody knows my password already. There's two things about SSL verification. Since we're using legit search, we don't need that. And then um, CEIP enabled, we'll say true. We'll leave that turned on. We'll hit enter, it'll ask for our certificate password. It's just VMware. Um, it asks for the admin password, same thing. It wants our shared secret for radius. I'll go copy and paste that. 
so that I don't get it wrong. I'll paste it again. All right, I'm gonna minimize some of these windows. It's creating a log file for us, which is cool in case something fails. Um, it's now asking for uh, my password, and that's because we've specified password in that target property. Uh, but I wanted to have this screen up when we go to this next step. Password. Hit enter. So the first step is it powers off this appliance, then it deletes the appliance, and then it deploys a new one. So you gotta be very careful with this script. You don't wanna just leave it sitting around where somebody uh, who doesn't know what they're doing could run it because it will delete the appliance. Um, if we do things right, and you know we have all of our configuration documented in that INI file, it's no real big loss, right? It would be um, maybe like a five minute outage or so as the new appliance uh, gets deployed, boots up and is back and running. Uh, but definitely something that you want to uh, keep in mind. If, if you run this script it, and target uh, an appliance name that already exists, it does not ask you to confirm you want to delete it. It just does it for you because it assumes you know what you're doing. Um, neat feature. It, it's really cool. You know, if you had um, a handful of these, I, I would assume, especially if you had configured the HA piece and, you know, taking one out of service doesn't really impact anything because the, the rest of them kind of just cover for the one. It would be a great way to do like a, a rolling upgrade from one version to another. It's just to delete one, deploy a new one, that sort of thing. Um, and, and, you know, we'd, we'd be sure that our config is the same every time. Hey, Brian, you mentioned earlier that there's really no um, in-place upgrade for these UAG appliances. So this is probably the way that they would do it then, right? You just redeploy? Yeah. Yeah, if it were me, I would for sure um, have my config, you know, just kind of saved out there as files with the appliance name. And then if um, if a new version came out, uh, you know, there's a little bit of effort. There's, there's usually a pretty good job of, uh, like, in the UAG 3.5 documentation, it calls out that there's a couple of new properties. I think there's one uh, that you can specify in this INI file that you want SSH enabled. And I believe that's new with the 3.5 release. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there are some properties that will get added to the INI file over time. The 3.4 release, the, uh, you know, the most recent one before 3.5, actually had a uh, license addition property that you needed to specify because at the 3.4 release had like standard advanced and enterprise licenses that mapped to your horizon or workspace one entitlement. Um, mm. That went away in 3.5, uh, thankfully, because um, in, in 3.4 UAG standard did not entitle you to do this uh, authentication based at the UAG. So like if you had radius configured on the UAG, which was uh, what we documented as the best practice. And then you went and upgraded to 3.4 and you had standard edition horizon, you would no longer be entitled to that feature, um, which uh, I had a customer who was not super happy about. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> because they were, they were doing such a thing, not, not with uh, radius, but with RSA. Uh. And so in 3.5, thankfully that, that went away. There's no more you know, license edition uh, parameter. Um, we can actually, this will still take a little bit. So when this gets done deploying, it will power the appliance on for us. And then the script kind of sits here and waits until VMware tools starts reporting uh, the IP address of the appliance. But while it does, we'll wait here just a second to see it turn on. Yep, and now it says it's waiting for IP address. So we'll go in here uh, and maybe look at this script just a little bit because you know the script's not scary. It's nothing super special. Um, it's it's actually just a wrapper for uh, OVF tool. So there's a there's a thing called OVF tool that you need to install. I've got a link to that. It'll be in the the doc I send over to you, Steve. Um, but OVF tool, you know, expect, expects all these command line properties uh, that you pass into the tool that get used as the, the VM is deployed. 
if you don't have it, um, well, you know, the script does check to see if OVF tool is present. Um, and it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't account for customers who may have installed something into the, like the D drive. If I had a customer had to modify the script, you know, this one line where it's looking for C program files, you know, OVF tool. Um, you know, every time they ran it, they got an error that OVF tool wasn't found. So we just went in and changed this to be the D colon, you know, program files directory. Um, but it, it just reads through all of those INI properties and then uh, basically builds this long list of uh, things to pass into OVF tool. And then at the very end, so, so we can even see some of that standard advanced enterprise licensing stuff um, was actually, you know, still in the script. This isn't used in 3.5, but the, it's still in the script. But when we get down to the end, we can see that um, PowerShell is just saying run OVF tool. This is the path that was specified earlier to the executable. Pass in all the options that were in the INI file. Uh, pass in the source, which is the uh, it's also in the INI file of um, where the OVA is stored. And then target is the, the target path to, uh, you know, what folder and, and whatnot in vCenter we want this to show up in. Um, so this is just a, you know, kind of elaborate wrapper uh, to pass arguments to OVF tool. So OVF tool is a prerequisite. The script is just formatting that INI file to be passed in uh, that way. Hey, Brian, can you go back to the directory where all those files are? I just want to see it. They were, oh, where was it? Um, oh, was it uh, maybe the zip file here? Uh, there was a, a spot earlier you showed where it was, yes, all that. So all those INI files for the different deployment options. I just wanted to see. So Azure, you see, so we can deploy these in other types of environments. Huh? Yeah. I, I've never done that, um, but I, I would assume you would need this like HV. I'm assuming that that is Hyper-V and then EC2, yeah. AWS. Um, so I think you'd use one of these different scripts and I'm assuming it's not using OV. Actually, you know what? We've got a minute here. Let's just uh, drag this over here and open this script. I'm assuming OVF tool isn't a thing for Hyper-V. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Looks totally different, right host. Yeah, it's a little bit longer. Um, it's like it's building it by scratch or something. Yeah, so let's, let's, I guess we start at the beginning, right? That's a logical place to start. Um, <laughs> but I, on the uh, the one for vSphere, you know, it, it's looking for um, the OVF tool. But yeah. It's like one of the first things that it's doing. Um, I think after it validated all the IP stuff. This doesn't seem to be doing that. It looks like it's doing all the validation of the input stuff, uh, sizing the appliance. Oh, see, it's using like stop VM. These must be just like native Hyper-V yeah. uh, commandlets or, or something. I don't know, that could be a... I think it is. Because it's VHDX path. Um, Copy the initial VHDX image file. So do yeah, we provide, we don't provide this in different, like a VHDX file format, do we? Um, I don't think so. Hmm. Let's see here, where is it getting this VA? Well, maybe OVA, I mean, that's an open virtualization standard, I guess, right? So maybe it's bundled with yeah. it. Yeah, maybe it's in here. What if we open this and... So OVAs are just zip files, really, right? And it's got a BMDK in it. I don't know if that's a... I'm not sure what they're doing here to make this VHDX thing. This is... Huh. All right, let's go back to um, this guy here. And so it looks like it's uh, booted up. We'll make sure that it's... Yeah. TAM lab, we'll go to port 9443. It's going to complain about your cert probably. Oh no, you included yeah, because the we, we yeah, yeah, put the cert in the thing when we loaded it. So uh, one one win for the, the yeah. script way of doing things. 
Um, we'll go into our edge services. Horizon's already enabled. All these things are working. It's actually more stuff working than before because we actually specify some more properties than we did. Right. They were in the INI file. And then uh, under authentication, under radius, we should see uh, TAM lab number two, yep, yeah, right here in our password hint. Um, if we go to this thing, it says TAM lab number two, VDI test is already kind of pre-populated in there for us. We need our little number generator, 891225. Logged us in, we've got that checkbox set to enforce the usernames to be the same. Type our password again, hope we got it. Yep, there we go. So yeah, that, that worked. And I, so I, I just like that, uh, that PowerShell deployment so much better because it's got all of that config pre-done. I didn't have to type stuff in and obviously get it wrong like, we, like I did the first go round. Um, but yeah, you know, especially if a customer has a handful of these, you know, I've, one of my customers has like five of them running uh, for one environment. So trying to enter all this stuff the same way five times is just kind of begging for an error to happen. Yeah, I I really like the concept of treating it like cattle, not pet, right? And just, if you have a problem, you just redeploy it, almost like a container workload. One other thing that I, I, I forgot to cover the first time. So if you configure it by hand, there's actually a, a button down here where we can export an INI file. Um, and so this is, mo <laughs> see, this is actually more stuff than we passed in because even the default stuff gets exported. Um, there are some things that are missing in here as compared to, let's see if I can do that. And then uh, let's go back over here. So this is the INI file that we used. Let's see if I can do that. There we go. So like there's way more stuff in this one from the export than there was on this one that we imported from. But like if there's a property that's set and you don't know what the property name is and it's hard to find in like you know, either this documentation or this documentation. You can just configure it in the UI, export it, and then go find it in here. And then uh, almost everything that I've tried to like copy from one to the other does work. I, I'm sure there's probably one that, that doesn't work like this shared secret thing. I'm thinking that might, uh, might fail, but I haven't actually tried it. Mm. Yeah, that's slick. I like that option. Just dump it all out. Yeah. Uh, so that makes it uh, makes it easy, I think. Um, rolled over a little bit past the hour. I, I can I can hang out a little bit longer if you want, uh, but do want to respect people's time. So appreciate everybody who kind of dialed in to watch this and kind of stumble through it together. Um, I'll type up some docs and get it over to you, Steve, for when the video gets posted. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for doing this. Uh, super cool. I, I remember playing around with the UAG maybe two years ago, and it was still relatively new. And we needed to do a lot of stuff uh, manually. It, it wasn't all there for you in the GUI. So it's come a long way. Yeah, it's super slick. And, and like I said, I've got it um, you know, in my lab. It set, sits in a... Uh, not a DMZ, but I've, I've wrapped some NSX rules around it that say, you know, deny everything uh, in or out of the UAG. And then right above that, I list out all of the specific, you know, you can connect to horizon and you can connect to radius, but you can't connect to anything else. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a neat little thing that you can do as well. If you kind of want to experiment with like NSX rules and that sort of thing, there's all sorts of rules and it's super picky. So, uh, um, it's another fun exercise, you know, using something like log insight to stumble through, you know, uh, what's being blocked and then go create rules to allow it. Very good. Any other questions from anyone? Yeah, hi, it's Mark. I'm, I stepped away for a minute. My apologies if you answered that. Uh, for uh, EUC, it's our, our best practice is to always create a new um, a, a new UAG instead of upgrading the, the others. 
And, and is that, but did you mention that uh, as part of your talk? Yeah. So I wasn't even aware that there was a upgrade path. Um, I, I, is, is that a thing? Well, in, out, in the EUC training of it, they did suggest that there was one, but the problem uh, that has occurred in the past is that the upgrade has not always been successful uh, mm -hmm. on top of it. And so that they've always said, and again, my apologies if you even mentioned it because I had a customer call, was that uh, always just, you know, obviously 3.5, start a new version, a new, a new blank bare metal, install 3.6, take your config file from 3.5, load it into 3.6, and you're ready to go. Because if anything should happen, you can always easily roll back to it. Yeah, I guess we talked through that just a little bit. So I, I wasn't even aware that there was an upgrade path, or I, I've never even seen a download to try and upgrade it. So I've never even pursued that. Um, what the PowerShell script will do is if you try and deploy a new UAG with the same name as an existing UAG, it will power that thing off for you, delete it, and deploy a new one with the same name and the whatever configuration is detailed in the INI file. Um, so I, I don't think that's the, the, the same workflow you talked about of, you know, exporting the config, deploying a new one, importing the config. It, it's roughly the same, but, um, you know, if, if you have that INI file kind of predefined with, you know, what the ideal config is, um, you know, you, you should be able to, you know, the end result would be the same. You would end up with a new appliance, same name, um, and, and then the same configuration. I, I guess um, one thing that you could do, um, and, and this could probably either be changed in the script or it could be something that you just do as kind of a manual workflow if you wanted to have that back out procedure is uh, power off an existing UAG and rename it to, you know, like, dash backup or something, right? You know, UAG dash backup. Otherwise, the script, even if it's powered off and just sitting out there, the script will still delete it. Um, so, Thank you. so yeah, you, you want to be careful that whatever is specified in the name of the UAG isn't something that you care about. Because if I replace this with like, you know, domain controller, it's gonna, it's not going to check that it's a UAG. It's going to stop it, uh, delete it and deploy something with that name. Sure. All right. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Hey, no problem. Thanks for, thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, any other questions before we close it out? All righty. Well, have a great week, everyone. Thanks again, Brian. This was awesome. And I will uh, definitely post this once the recording is available. So take care, everybody. Have a good weekend. All right, thanks.